<laughs> okay, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the August 2nd version of the West Shore Photography Cl Club meeting. We have a very special presentation for you tonight, but just a couple things before that. Uh, I'd like to remind you that next Monday night, we have an image review. There is no theme, and our good friend Bryson Leidick will be the reviewer. Now, let me take just a second and talk to you about uh, some discussions that, that Joe and I and, uh, and uh, Mary and Norb and a few people have been having. Uh, the competition level, or, or the I should say, the photography expertise level in this club uh, continues to go up and up. Uh, we're seeing beautiful, beautiful images, and, and many of them very technically well done. Uh, we have asked our reviewers and judges to ramp it up a little bit. Now, by that I mean, we've asked them to be a little more critical with their reviews. Um, some of the reviews are, are nice and, and they're pleasant. And, 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 and we want that to get the pleasantness we want to continue. But we want to look for uh, a level of technicality that is appropriate uh, for the group. So uh, I don't think it'll be anything alarming or upsetting, but it will be a matter of uh, the judges maybe uh, looking more scrutinizing your images. Uh, I'm muting some people, pardon me, uh, a little more carefully. And still, we want them, we're going to emphasize that they bring out the things that they like about the image, but stress, you know, things that, that they find that, that are distractions or, or maybe uh, take away from the image a little bit. So to be a little more critical, that's just a, a forewarning there. Uh, okay, uh, the deadline, uh, as always now, is midnight Thursday, so get your image uh, uploaded to the website, and uh, as Mike said last uh, week, you know, it, it's not always your best image that you're looking to put up there just to show off. Okay, uh, what you should be looking at is an image you have questions about uh, that you've maybe worked on and you're not sure, you know, how would somebody else perceive it? So don't be afraid to put up an image that you question. You know, let's get the, the, the opinion of a more experienced photographer, you know, so to help you out. Okay, uh, the schedule for the upcoming year. Of course, our, our new club year starts in September. Uh, it's only a month away, and we have a great uh, kickoff meeting scheduled for the second Monday in September. That's because the first Monday is Labor Day, uh, and Joe will tell you about that later on uh, sometime. But my point is that uh, we have the themes for next year, and we have the dates pretty much solidified. So uh, sometime this week, I suspect, I will send out a, to everyone via the, the email a copy of the schedule for next year, every, every meeting date, and the competitions, the image reviews, and the themes. So here are the themes. There are five themes that we've selected for next year, and, and we'll have, this will all be written down for you so that you don't need to write it down, but, and it's in the recording if you want to watch that. October the 25th is going to be street photography. January the 10th is night photography. February the 28th fog. April the 11th, peeling paint. All right. And June the 6th, graceful, graceful. Those are the five themes for next year. As I say, that'll all come to you via an email uh, sometime this week. Uh, okay. Before Joe tells you about, uh, or introduces our speaker and tells you about upcoming events. Oh, let me just say that, uh, Mary and Eve and I went to the Shippensburg Fair last Wednesday evening and, and had a great time. Uh, it rained a little bit, uh, but it was a nice affair. And my objective was to get one picture. I wanted a picture during the blue hour, a long exposure of the Ferris wheel. So I spent an hour from the time the sun started going down until it was, the sky was completely black, got mucho pictures like that, and I was able to pick out the one I liked best. And the interesting thing was, as I varied the uh, exposure length, like from a second, two seconds, 10 seconds, you know, the pattern varied because of the way the lights light up on the Ferris wheel as it's going around. So I posted that on the Facebook group. Uh, many, of course, uh, of you have already seen that. 
So uh, let me take a minute. If you have uh, something uh, noteworthy regarding photography, uh, would you unmute yourself and make that announcement? Maybe it's a, an upcoming event, a sunflower field that's in bloom, uh, or a fair that's uh, about to take place, or, or some photo opportunity. Anybody have anything? It's called waiting time. Uh, Joe, the, I'm um, sorry, Dennis, the um, monarch butterflies are starting to move. It's the, just the very, very beginning of the fall migration. Okay. So any place that has, uh, today I was at the old Silver Spring Golf Course, which is no longer a golf course. It's now a nature area. And um, they, they are, they're starting to show up. So anybody that has certain kinds of flowers or plants, even in their yard, you'll see them coming through your yard. So that's, that's going to be happening here in the next couple of weeks for sure. Very cool. And, and uh, what types of plants do monarch butterflies uh, frequent? Um, they frequent a plant called Joe Pie weed, uh, milkweed are their two main stopping points. Okay. Very good. Thanks, Mike. Anybody else? Oh, um, Dennis, along that same note, there's a, a walking path by um, the hospital in Hershey that has planted a, a whole row of flowers, including a lot of milkweed, just to draw the butterflies. Mm -hmm. So that would be a great spot to go to look for those. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Patty. Yep. Anybody else? Okay, thanks guys. Uh, Joe, it's all yours. Okay, um, thank you, Dennis. Uh, our upcoming trip is gonna be this Saturday and Elaine Shook is going to tell us about that in a minute and to uh, Hershey Gardens. But tonight we have Elaine uh, Shook who has taken the time to prepare a presentation for us tonight on creating impactful floral images. And thanks for putting that slide up there, Elaine, because I can read that right off the screen. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, um, and then this coming Saturday, She's going to host us at the Hershey Gardens for taking the, the instruction she gives us tonight and put it into use. And that'll be at nine o'clock next Saturday, but I'm sure she's gonna talk about that. Elaine comes to us, uh, from, to the Wisher uh, Photography Club from the corporate world where she has um, fairly, fairly recently hung up her, her shingle there. I mean, her, her, uh, her whatever, her hat and and centered into uh, floral photography and actually a lots of other genres in, within photography itself. And she is, if you looked at her images on Facebook and we have numerous photographers, uh, Patricia is one of them here who's on, on our uh, session tonight who have done just outstanding work. And Elaine has uh, offered to give us this presentation. So Elaine, it is all yours. Thank you, Joe. Uh, first, I wanna say that I really am truly honored to have been asked to speak to you tonight about my approach to floral photography and my goal to create an image that conveys not only my vision, what I see with my eyes, but how I respond, how I react, how I feel. So much more than what a what Joe would call a happy snapper photo would uh, convey. Um, so, in that light, I, I plan to talk quite a bit tonight. Um, hopefully, I won't ramble on a whole lot about it. But I'm going to talk about something that is very near and dear to my heart, and that is um, artistic. I'm drawing a blank here. Um, art <laughs> artistic vision. Um, I have to tell you all that, again, it's been a very long time since I've done this. And as Dennis said, um, that the level of skill and talent in this group is really impressive. And so while I am honored to speak to you, 
I am also, um, I find it very daunting. So it's a little bit nerve wracking. So if I start to stumble over my words as I already have, <laughs> then um, please be patient. Or if it's possible, possible to give me a quick virtual kick in the butt, go ahead and do that. I will not be offended. Uh, I'm not, I don't think Zoom has that function, but maybe I could suggest it. <laughs> <laughs> Might want to request. <laughs> Elaine, um, let, me, let me just interject if I can for a second. If anybody has a question, we're going to ask you to put them into chat. Elaine has a, a very ambitious presentation tonight, and we need to move it along pretty quickly. So if you put it into chat, we will ask Elaine the questions at the appropriate time. Okay. I also want to give you a quick disclaimer, and that is that what I have to say tonight is based solely on my personal experiences and what works best for me. It is by no means carved in stone or any kind of official rule of photography. Um, we are all unique individuals. We perceive things differently. We take different approaches. Um, we all have different techniques that work best for us. So if something doesn't make sense to you, please interpret it in a way that does make sense to you or take only those things that you think you can take back with you to help you improve your photography. I'm sure I can learn a lot from all of you as well. So I do encourage you to um, comment, um, ask questions if, if you need to as well, but also suggest any ideas that you might have that I haven't addressed. Okay, um, artistic vision is something that is very near and dear to my heart because it's been a critical component in helping me to create that truly impactful image. And this says so much more than that snapshot. Um, artistic vision is, it's a very conceptual thing, um, very abstract, and therefore it is difficult for me to define um, in a way that makes sense to me and to anyone else who uses vision in their artistry. Again, we are all very different. Different people um, interpret artistic vision differently and different artists use different, different techniques to get to their vision. As an example, um, a creative artist who is naturally born with a, a vivid imagination can actually create in her mind a vision without even seeing the subject. And she uses that, or he uses that image in her mind to, as a reference point and as inspiration for painting, for example. Um, there are other people who go out and see with their eyes their subject, but they perceive it in a different way than it's really presented in reality. I've heard a couple of photographers who are very passionate about monochromatic photography and they do strictly or almost strictly black and white photographs who have said that they see the image, they see the subject or the scene in black and white before they take the photograph. Um, I personally am not wired that way and I'm not sure that um, most of us are. So for me, artistic vision is a process it's a process of discovery where I see what I want to photograph. Um, and, and through that discovery process, that means that my eyes have to be wide open, my mind has to be wide open so that nature can bring that, that image to me. Vision is also experiencing the moment just really kind of relishing in what you see and experiencing the feeling that you have. It's visceral, it's sensory, it's very emotional. And also it's a process of becoming aware of how you perceived the image and what exactly about that image captured your attention so much that you want to, uh, you want to photograph it. At the bottom of this, Green is, and I'm not sure you can all see it, is a quote that I stole from a book written by Rick, um, 
Sam. I'm not sure if you're all familiar with him. Um, if you're not, Rick is an incredibly talented photographer. He's an inspirational speaker, and he also writes books. Um, this quote was attached to one of his images of a frog. And it goes like this. We think too small like the frog at the bottom of the well. He thinks the sky is only as big as the top of the well. If he surfaced, he would have an entirely different view. Now that was not written by Rick. That is a quote from Mao Zedong. Um, and as simplistic as it seems to me, it really struck a chord because it is a, such an obvious analogy of the challenges that I and many other people have when they try to find their vision in art or photography. So to elaborate on the process, the discovery process in my mind is the most critical component in finding your vision. I have found many times that I am so focused on finding a particular subject, a very specific flower that I know I want to photograph, that I don't see anything else around me. I become tunnel visioned, like that frog in the well. I see nothing but what I might see at the end of my lens. Uh, there are other times where I become so focused on mastering my camera and figuring out how I'm going to set that camera to get the perfect exposure and the perfect focus that I am literally seeing nothing but what's in the frame, within the frame in my viewfinder. So I have become, in many ways, my biggest obstacle in finding my discovery discovering my, my vision. Um, so my advice to any of you who may relate to this is don't chase your vision, let it come to you. Open your eyes, open your mind, look at everything around you. There's so much that nature has to offer. And let her bring it to you. Eliminate distractions wherever you can, including your mental distractions. Cut your brain down and stop thinking about those technical issues or stop thinking about anything else that is going on in your life and eliminate the physical barriers wherever you can or distractions such as people. Uh, I try to avoid going to destination spots over the weekend when the crowds are massive such as uh, Longwood Gardens or um, Middle Creek is another one, especially in, the, in February when there's tens of thousands of geese and thousands of people crowding to get the pictures. Um, and unless, of course, you, in, you intend to include people as, as a point of interest in your image, um, that would be a different story. Most importantly, just allow nature to encompass you, to capture your imagination, control your senses, so that you are able to receive everything that she has to show you. So often, when I am focused on finding something myself, I come away very disappointed. And I give up, I pack up my bags, and as soon as I get in the car, bang, some, something just drops right in front of my face, because at that point, I've stopped being focused. Experiencing the moment is, this, this is actually the fun part for me. This is where I'm in my zone. I, I can immerse myself in the beauty, and just embrace the visceral, visceral responses and, and the way I feel. Um, you just capture the moment in your mind, and that visual in your mind is what you will use as, as a reference for when you go to photograph that image. Awareness and evaluation then comes after, after you come out of your reverie, you put on your thinking cap, your analytical hat, and you define exactly what it is in that flower that captured your attention in the first place. 
what is it about that flower that made you feel the emotion that you felt? Is it the brilliant hot red color, that eye popping color that just made you stand back and say, wow? Or was it the softness of the petals of the leaves, the simple lines, the soft softness of the color that made you feel a sense of serenity or peacefulness? Or was it the intricate detail in the center of that flower that just gave you a sense of awe and amazement and intrigue? There are so many different features of the flower that, can, that you can perceive that cause a different reaction. And it's those reactions that you also want to convey in your image that hopefully your viewers will also feel. So it's important that not only you identify what feature it was in that flower that captured your attention, but what, what emotion did it evoke in you? How did you feel about that? And once you answer those questions for yourself, you can plan your approach to recapturing your vision in a photographic image, because at that point, you will know what you need to focus on in the image. What, what parts of it do you want to de-emphasize? What parts do you want to emphasize to draw the eye to the very thing that caused you to feel the way you felt? Then it's time to take the shot. And these are just a few general guidelines um, because every flower is going to be different. Every vision is going to be different. There are no absolutes. In photographing flowers, it is strictly dictated by your vision and the environmental influences and, and conditions. I typically will shoot in manual mode because I'm kind of a control freak and I want to control both the shutter speed and the aperture or the depth of field. Um, if it's not a breezy day at all, then shutter speed isn't really an issue. So aperture priority mode is perfectly fine. Uh, I sometimes do that myself, although I prefer to shoot in manual because I prefer to shoot at least as fast as 1 2 50th of a second, just because I'm usually shooting close and I want to minimize any camera shake. Um, when I'm shooting really close in macro mode, I'm setting my aperture to f11 or higher, usually around 13 or 14, to increase that depth of field so that the entire flower or whatever part of the flower is filling that frame is totally in focus. Uh, that's not as necessary if you're shooting flower that takes up only a part of the frame and is not as close. Um, some people really prefer that the back side of the flower be soft, fading out a little bit, shows you a sense of depth of that flower. Um, so it all depends upon what your vision looks like um, and how soft you want the background and what background you're dealing with. Um, know what aperture setting to use. I increase shutter speed on breezy days um, in order to freeze the flower motion. However, some people like to see that flower motion. It's a little different look. So in that case, you don't have to increase the shutter speed. You even slow it down if you want to show a lot of motion in that flower. Um, but I also increase the shutter speed when shooting with wide um, a wide aperture because the aperture, of course, is going to let in more light, so I compensate by increasing that shutter speed. I shoot with the lowest ISO possible. Um, most cameras today uh, are pretty tolerant of noise and do a pretty good job with noise reduction. But when you're shooting a close up of a flower that has a lot of detail in it, noise becomes very apparent and it obliterates the natural detail in that flower. So I try to keep my ISO down to the lowest possible native level, usually 64 or 100, um, which I believe is lower than my native. Um, 
Sometimes I will shoot manual with auto ISO and let the camera set the ISO for me, but I typically find that when I do that, it will overcompensate and overexpose based on my vision. Now, it may be perfectly exposed in the camera's mind, but it doesn't know what my vision is. And I typically shoot a little darker um, rather than lighter because I just prefer darker, moodier shots for one thing. And I also feel that it's easier for me um, to overexpose and blow out the highlights than it is to flip the shadows if it's underexposed. In my mind, in blown out whites are much more distracting than a clipped shadow. So I would, I typically will almost always set my EV comp to a minus one third or two thirds of a stop just because I know that the camera typically exposes a little higher than I want it to. I use spot metering almost exclusively on flowers, also on birds. Um, the reason I do that is because flowers, especially white flowers, light colored flowers, reflect light. Um, many of them have iridescent petals with some other reflective quality that will also reflect light. And when you're shooting reflected light on the white flower, you're going to end up with an overexposed flower and no detail. So I always spot meter flowers. Um, likewise, brightly colored flowers like orange, red, bright yellow, they don't reflect light so much, but they absorb it. And when they absorb light, they can easily become oversaturated if you overexpose. So I also will, will spot meter the brightly colored flowers as well. Evaluate your compositional obstacles and distractions. That's a pretty obvious one, but it's amazing how many times that I forget to look at everything in the frame and see what's going to be a, a deterrent to getting a good composition in that photo. So look for things like trees that aren't in the right place for you or uh, the ground. If you're shooting a flower that's low in the ground and you're shooting from the top down, usually not a great background because in places where there are lots of trees, you end up with sticks and dead leaves and other detritus that is not a desirable background for you. So I look for that and change my perspective so that that is no longer in the image. Um, in that case, if it's growing low to the ground, I'll try to get down on the ground and point the camera towards the flower and not the ground and get more of a profile view of it that way. Also, it's good to shoot loose to allow for some kind of a Popping when you go into post-process. Post um, I often find that I want to eliminate things that really weren't desirable in the background, so I'll crop it. Or I also decide after the fact that maybe I want to zoom in on this flower a little bit more, so I will crop it. If you, if you zoom in to the point that you think that you want that flower to be, then there is no room for, there's no wiggle room at all. Uh, you also need a little wiggle room when you're doing any kind of bracketing or focus stacking because when the, when the camera or whatever software you use to merge them tries to do the alignment, it will automatically crop it for you. So allow a little extra room for that as well. Watch your histogram and your light meter before you take that shot. Uh, this is a tool that I use on a regular basis just to make sure that the exposure that I want, I'm going to get based on my current settings. Take multiple shots. Experiment with many different perspectives. 
um, that will vary from what your original vision was and vary, and vary your shooting and your zoom distance, the angle that you take it from, um, and experiment with light and focus bracketing as well. Get as many different perspectives and looks as you can, even though your original vision may look totally different because this will give you a lot more options when you go in and start looking at them and you may find one that you like a lot better than your original vision. Um, I take lots of them. What I don't do is typically is um, first shot. Bursting is good in certain situations, but if you're not changing anything between those fast shots, then you're gonna end up with many duplicates of exactly the same image. And I'm kind of stingy when it comes to my uh, hard space, so I don't do that unless something is mo moving. Um, if the flower is moving in the breeze, then you might wanna consider that. Um, Joe, made a suggestion to me about a week ago, how he uses uh, bursting in situations where he's moving. Joe, would you kind of elaborate on that a little bit? It was an idea that I had not thought of. It was a, we covered that in a um, uh, program on focus stacking a while back, whereby um, I would use a burst mode and then very slowly, gradually go towards and back and by moving my body towards the flower or wherever I'm photographing. Because if I did that without changing the focus, I would get different focus points. And uh, that's something that I do. An interesting concept. And I think I am going to try that. I, I very often just move my body around to get different angles, different perspectives, um, or to get the best focus when I'm not on a, uh, using a tripod, I find it easier to focus close up when I'm shooting um, uh, without a tripod because my body, unbelievably, is a little more flexible than my tripod. So I can, I can get uh, more infinite um, positions that will allow me to focus better. That's usually when I'm focusing manually. Elaine, if I can interrupt you here, that was a question that we had. Um, about what percentage of your shots when you're doing flower photography would be with a tripod versus handheld? Probably not more than 15%. I prefer to, to, sh to shoot handheld just, for, just for that reason that I stated, because I, I have a lot more flexibility that way, but also, I don't like to take tripods on field trips with me just because of the weight. I try to travel as lightly as I, I possibly can. I always use tripods when I'm focus stacking um, or bracketing, um, or if I'm shooting very low to the ground and I have to put the camera in a position where it's under the flower, uh, I will use a very low ground level tripod for that. Um, there are a few situations where tripods are definitely critical, but for the most part, I shoot handheld. Thank you. And then shoot at the subject's eye level. What I mean by that is get down to wherever the, the head of the flower is. Um, I talked a little bit about shooting down to the ground and getting that horrible, dirty background. Um, if, if you're shooting down because you want to see the detail in that flower, it's almost unavoidable that you're going to be shooting downward. But in that case, sometimes you are filling the frame with the flower and you're not gonna see the background anyway. Sometimes you can move the flower slightly so that it's not facing up, it's facing uh, forward so that you can get that tripod down low and look it in the eye and shoot it so that you're shooting away from the ground and towards the background. I sometimes have to get on my belly to do this because there are a lot of low growing flowers that look down. Um, and I will, I will get down on my back, 
point the camera up towards it and shoot from that direction. I set my drive mode to single exposure um, rather than um, double exposure or um, any kind of sequential exposure for the reasons that we talked about a little bit earlier. Unless, of course, you're shooting the moving targets or you're bracketing. I set autofocus mode to AFS single point, again, unless I am shooting moving targets. Elaine, on that point, another question. On, do you ever shoot, uh, do you ever manually focus? And what percentage of the time do you manually focus versus autofocus? I do manual focus when I'm shooting macros. Um, sometimes I will start out with autofocus, get it to the point where it's close to where I want it to be, and then I'll override it with the manual mode and just, just to refine the focus. Um, sometimes if I'm so close and actually shooting in micro mode with um, magnification filters, I will put it in manual from the beginning. But I would say probably 90% of the time I'm in autofocus. I trust autofocus a lot more than I trust my own visual acuity. Thank you. Polarizing lenses are probably one of the most necessary accessories that you can have in your bag when shooting outside. I tend to shoot more in my backyard, which is uh, mostly shaded. And when I'm in the shade, I don't need it. But when I'm out in full sun in harsh light, which is often the case, or if there is um, very contrasting light, filtered light coming through the trees, even though it's in the shade, then I will always use a circular polarizer to to block that glare. Again, if you've got a lot of glare coming from a white flower that is reflecting that harsh light, you're gonna, you're gonna blow out the detail in that flower. It's really important to bring that polarizer with you. And especially when you're going to places like Hershey, that is wide open there. Um, we're going at nine o'clock, so it won't be quite as harsh but I guarantee you, you will still have a lot of reflected light on those flowers. As you're shooting, check your exposure, um, focus in, and your depth of field in your viewfinder or LCD before taking the shot. I check the light meter in my viewfinder to, to verify the exposure values. And sometimes that value is under zero, but that's usually the way I want it. But just check to see it is where you want it. I monitor the histogram or the blinkies to, to detect any blown out highlights or clipped shadows. And if you have focus peaking options or a depth of field preview option on your camera, use those as well. It's a quick way just to double check your, your depth of field, which you can't see in the um, in your viewfinder um, comes in very handy for me. Focus peaking I, is, I think may not be available on DSLRs. I'm not sure, I didn't have it on my older DSLR, but that will point out to you with blinkies what pixels are in focus. And I found that incredibly helpful. Okay, using a tripod, um, Obviously for long exposures, which isn't very typical when you're shooting flowers or when exposure uh, or focus bracketing. So what's in my bag? Um, for flowers, I am typically shooting with my mirrorless camera. It's a micro four thirds camera, so it's got a two times crop factor in it. And what I like about that sensor size is that it allows me to get much closer. Uh, the lenses, um, my favorite lens is actually a kind of a short zoom. It's a 40 to 150 millimeter zoom, which is the equivalent of 80 to 300 on a, a full frame camera. 
I will sometimes even attach the 1.4 teleconverter to increase that zoom even more. And I, I will do that very often when I want a very soft bokeh in the background. Um, and I can still get a good sharp image, a good sharp flower with a beautiful background by compressing it with the longer zoom. I will use the 12 to 40 zoom, which is the equivalent of 24 to 80 in a full frame for gardenscapes or any wide angle shot um, that includes flowers or landscapes. But I will also use that lens when I want to do some kind of bracketing, I need to shoot fairly loosely. Um, I'm using a tripod in that situation, but it just allows enough room for cropping when I'm shooting close like that. Um, it also has incredible sharpness. The 60 millimeter macro lens, which is the equivalent of 120 millimeter on a full frame camera, um, I always use when I'm doing really close macro shots where I'm shooting just the inside of that flower or even getting closer to shoot say, for example, just one pistol that is tack sharp and everything else is out of focus. Um, in those cases, I'm always using a tripod. So that's kind of the gamut. Um, I also have a uh, 300 millimeter lens, a prime lens, which is the equivalent of 600 millimeters. And I've used that in several occasions too to come up with really beautiful boca, really soft look. So anything goes, it just depends upon what look you are looking for. What else? Of course, the polarizing filter is in my bag. I sometimes bring my close up magnifying filters when I do want to do some really close macros or micros. Remote shutter release is really helpful if you're doing some long exposures. Uh, spare batteries are obviously a necessity. Bring lots of them and lots of extra memory cards because you're going to be shooting lots of, of shots at different perspectives. Lens cleaning kit, especially when you're using a polarizing filter. I can't seem to keep my fingers off of the, the lens when I'm rotating that polarizing filter. So it's constantly getting smudged up. Small soft paintbrush or pastry brush. Um, I use that for dusting off small specks or grains of dust or dirt on flowers where it would be very noticeable. I have often come back with shots where I didn't notice the dirt and I hadn't brushed anything off. Um, and had to spend a lot of time in post just removing those. Uh, I don't typically brush off anything else that is natural. I kind of like photographing flowers in their natural state, even those that have withered petals or um, bug spots on them. That's nature, and I like to reflect that. Small screwdrivers. I have a really tiny screwdriver in my bag all the time just because my tripod plate frequently comes loose and I have to tighten it. Small flashlights, also very useful for fill light. If you're in harsh light and you just want to reduce the shadows in the front of that flower slightly. I also use a speed light, an on-camera speed light with a diffuser, globe diffuser at very low power when I need some um, fill light. I also have a ring flash um, that I use for macro photography when I also need um, some fill light. I have found that the one that I have, and it's probably not the best one in the world, doesn't work necessarily really well. It doesn't give me enough light. Um, it, it can also be used in a um, constant LED mode. Um, but it, it just doesn't produce enough light for my taste. So I typically use the speed light and, and stop that down as far as I can so that I don't have any harsh bright flash in the flower. 
Umbrellas and reflector discs can be very useful when you're in harsh light and you want to shade the flower to eliminate those harsh shadows. It gives you a much more constant tonality across um, or just shade the flower because it's got so much reflection on it. You can also use a reflector disc, which can be used both for shading and for additional light. You just angle that thing towards the sun so that it reflects back on the part of the flower that you need some additional light. The reflector discs, unfortunately, are a little bit cumbersome and they're almost impossible to fold back up. So I don't typically use mine. Black and white foam core board for backgrounds. If you wanna get rid of the natural background and just have a solid black or white or color, comes in very handy. I usually use mine only when I'm shooting indoors. Again, because I don't like to carry big things around with me when I'm out in the field. Um, but I do like to have that black background when I'm isolating a flower just to remove all distractions so that the flower becomes the star of the show and nothing else. And of course your tripod and most importantly, take lots of water with you, sun green, sunscreen and sunglasses. Sunglasses not only to protect your eyes, but to help you get past the glare of the flowers because that glare can actually destroy your vision. The flowers look faded, they look free of detail, they just like look like big blobs of nothing. When you put polarizing sunglasses on, you can see their true rich colors and the detail pops right back out. Elaine, before we leave this slide, I had a couple of questions that came up. Uh, one of them is on your second item on the close-up magnifying filters. Um, how do you uh, feel about those and also extension tubes, which some people will use? Uh, can you give us an opinion or thoughts on those two? Yes, I can. I have used extension tubes and I have not been very successful in using them well. I find um, that even though they allow you to shoot closer, it's even more difficult to focus with those, um, whether I'm using a tripod or I'm um, using it handheld. Extremely narrow or a shallow depth of field. And so I find myself maneuvering my body in every which way, trying to get uh, the focal points in a the same focal level. And of course, my body doesn't stay that still, so it's impossible for me to, <laughs> to focus well on all of the parts that I want focused with those. I prefer the magnifying filters. Um, they just screw on the end of the lens. I can still get really close and actually magnify the detail that I'm trying to photograph. And I find that I can focus much better with those than I can with the, with the extension tubes. Okay. Maybe just me, I know a lot of people use the extension tubes and they, they are very happy with them, but I've never been successful with them. Okay, well, thank you. Two other questions came up. Do you ever use uh, plants or the clamps to, to hold the flower steady um, and then put a stake in the ground or attach it to your tripod? I, I have not done that. I, well, I have tried it. Uh, and I find that trying to clamp it to something that it does not naturally cling to makes it look very awkward. Or I just can't clamp it and still get the right angle that I want. Um, I will sometimes twist a flower around a leaf and the leaf will hold it in the position that I want. But using clamps or twist ties or anything else like that just doesn't work for me. Okay. I think you've answered the question that Patty had. Okay. Is that right, Patricia? Actually, no. no. Do, do you no. use clamps and stakes to remove plant parts from the frame? Get them out of your way. Oh, yeah, that I have done. Um, 
sometimes I just ask my husband to hold them back <laughs> if he happens to be out there. Um, but yeah, that, that's easy enough to do. And you don't have to worry about what looks natural and what does not look natural. Right. Um, if, if you had a, an errant leaf that was sticking in the way, did, have you ever just snapped it off and when no one was looking? Yes. Yeah. Well, I snapped it off when people were looking. So. <laughs> okay. <laughs> or sometimes you can just tuck it behind and it will stay there. Okay. This depends upon the situation, but I'm certainly not opposed to moving leaves and moving things around to, to help me composition. Okay. okay. Thank you. I'll let you continue here. The editing programs I use are basically Lightroom Classic and Photoshop. Lightroom Classic is my where I have my library. Um, and I do a great deal of my editing right there where only basic editing is needed. I use Photoshop as kind of a hub. When I want to access my plugins like Topaz Denoise and anything in the Nick collection in the Luminar, um, I use Photoshop itself a lot for things that I think it does better than Lightroom, um, like sharpening. I use a high pass sharpening tool um, in Photoshop. It does a much better job in my opinion than Lightroom. Um, there are a number of things that I do when layering is required in Photoshop, but mostly when I want to use multiple programs, I, I will create a separate layer for each of those programs so I can always delete it, turn it off without destroying the other edits that I applied. Um, Topaz Denoise AI is a wonderful denoise program. It intuitively removes the noise only where it will, will not destroy the detail behind it. Um, there's an advantage to that and a disadvantage. If you remove too much noise, then the flower tends to look very plastic underneath it. If you don't remove any of the noise, then all of that grain does hide the, the natural detail in the flower and it gives it a very coarse look. And flowers are just not coarse looking by nature. So there are some disadvantages to that. And sometimes you can adjust it um, in Denoise AI just by lowering the levels of, of sharpening or the levels of denoise. I use Nick Collection a lot. Um, I love the Color Effects program, it has a great detail extraction tool. A um, number of other things that I use quite regularly regularly in there. And also Luminar, which I like better for landscapes. But Luminar has got some great presets that um, will really make a photo glow. I, I use their um, Orton Effect preset in there quite often. It's very effective. Okay. Thank you, Elaine. Uh, while you were talking, another question came up. And that is, do you ever use the rear screen of your camera for composition or do you use the viewfinder? And the second part of that question by the audience was, do you have an articulating screen in the back that you'll flip it up, for instance, when you want to get down low? Yes, I do primarily use my rear view, my rear view, <laughs> my viewfinder. <laughs> because if, I find it easier to see in bright light rather than looking through the, the, the LED screen. My LED screen is articulating, so it does come in handy when you're shooting down close to the ground and you want to be able to see, you don't want to get down on the ground, but you still want to be able to see um, what the camera is, is looking like or what the image is looking like in the camera. Um, I use it a lot when I'm focus bracketing for that reason. Okay, thank you. Um, this uh, completes her first part of our presentation. Uh, yes, it is the first part, uh, completes that. The next part will be when she moves into Lightroom. So I'm gonna ask you, Elaine, if you can do that and uh, share your Lightroom screen. And then while you're doing it, I'm gonna chat for a second. 
Um, the best part, frankly, from my perspective, is when Elaine gets into the actual flowers and she shows them to you in Lightroom and how she captured it and what her thought processes were, when you see the actual live images is really, really, really helpful. And it is now uh, 7.57 and there's no way we're gonna get through all of these, that's for sure. And I'm gonna to suggest to Elaine that what we, maybe what we would do is you would go through some of these and then we would, as I maybe suggested earlier, we could do like a Wednesday night session where we could spend more time on these. And then it, that would be more of an open forum type of a thing. We wouldn't have to do chat. People could interact with you. And um, if that would be, I think that might be very helpful. And, we, and if we did that after, the field trip that we have on Saturday, I think that could be very, very helpful. Uh, would you be amenable to doing something like that on a Wednesday night, Elaine? Certainly. Okay, great. Um, and before we get into yours, can you tell us a little bit about what we're gonna do on Saturday and what people should bring? Okay, well, um, you will have a, a list of my, the lenses that I use and other suggested things to put in your bag, but you don't necessarily need to bring all of that. Um, again, I find that the, my go-to lens for florals is that uh, the 40 to 150, which is an 80 to 300. It is very versatile. Um, you can get everything but really macros with that lens, um, with that length of the lens. You can get, you can zoom in on flowers from a distance. It's handy when you can't get to a flower that's in the middle of the garden, you can't physically traipse through the garden to get to it. Mm -hmm. You want still a close-up shot, you can just zoom in and still get great detail with it. So that would be my first suggestion, is to bring that length of a lens. Otherwise, um, the 12 to 24, which is 12 to 40, which is a 24 to 80 for full frame. Um, it's also very good for, for landscapes and gardenscapes and just wider shots in general. And if you plan to do any macro, in your macro lens. Um, other than that, make sure you bring your polarizing filter um, if you have one. Um, that is most important in yourself. And of course, the sunglasses and sunscreen. And uh, we're going to be meeting at the Hershey Garden. So when you go in and pay your admission fee, which is like somewhere between twelve and thirteen dollars or something like that, depending upon your age, um, after you do that, then you would exit towards the garden side. And there's a big patio back out there, overlooking a lake. And that's where we're going to meet right there. And then Elaine will take us from there over to the uh, the spots where we're going to be doing our uh, our flower photography. For the next part here. If you have the screen uh, where you can see all of the folks that are on the Zoom call, if that's on the right-hand side of your display, you might wanna move that like I'm doing right now. You can't tell this, but I'm moving it to the left-hand side because on the right-hand side, it will be hiding her various ISO and her settings that she has. And that would be important for you to see that. And if you wanted to, you could just minimize that whole um, screen where we're showing the various folks talking so you can see the whole thing that she's gonna have here. And we're gonna take some of these and then we'll uh, maybe you know, four or five of them and give you a flavor for what she has. And then we'll maybe do that. And then we'll continue this on a Wednesday night. So Elaine, you got it. Okay. I'm just gonna pick a few at random that I think um are examples of various situations or styles or visions that I had, the challenges that I encountered in shooting them, what I did to resolve them, uh, what my vision looked like from, from the very beginning and whether or not I was able to achieve them, and why I set the camera the way I did. Um, let's start with this very first one. This is a shot that I actually took in a greenhouse. Now, if you do any shooting in greenhouses, you know that there are many, many obstacles in the background um, that usually need to be gotten rid of. Uh, this 
one was just kind of sticking up above the crowd of other pots. Um, I was immediately drawn to the texture in this flower. There was many, many petals that had all kind of curled um, in the shadows, the play of the shadows on each other. And then that gentle light of yellow coming out of the center just really struck me. And I knew that I had to make this an isolated flower and it will in fact be one of my series called um, Singular Sensation. And I wanted a very dark background, partly because of the contrast, but also to eliminate any of the, the um, ugliness of the background behind it. Because in these greenhouses, you have lots of signs, poles, and pots that are not clean, and you name it. Uh, so this one did not really require a lot of editing to achieve that background. Um, even though I was shooting with it a fairly, uh, well, I was shooting at the F11 in order to get the entire flower in focus. So it did increase the depth of field. Um, and I shot pretty high to reduce the exposure uh, so that the background, which was really quite a bit darker than the flower, the background would be underexposed. Uh, Elaine, would that 60 millimeters been your macro or, or not? You know, I don't think I had my macro lens with me at that time, and I was not shooting close. This was actually across the table from where I was standing, so I really doubt that. Okay. But I'm pretty sure I was shooting with my go-to lens, um, which does have an amazing depth of field, and I can get... I can zoom in, wasn't too zoomed in, but um, I can get great detail even with the zoom lens. Okay. This flower intrigued me because it's, it's one of the few hellebores in our gardens. Um, and we have many hellebores. We kind of grow them wild, we naturalize them. But it's one of the few that are white and have double petals. And I'm always intrigued by the gracefulness of these center petals. Uh, they just kind of curl and overlap each other and create shadows on each other. But I'm also always intrigued by the veining, the detailed veining in the petals. So for this one, Definitely spot metered it to make sure that I didn't overexpose the flower because if I did, you would not see any of that detail in the petals. Um, speed wasn't particularly an issue at this point because there was no breeze on that day, I don't believe. I was shooting a little bit further away because this is an example of one that was kind of in the middle of the garden that I wouldn't be traipsing in because my husband probably would have given me a fit. <laughs> um, it was not a difficult shot to take with the exception that it, it was in harsh light. And I believe I even had to move my body to give it some shade. Although you can see that there is side light that is creating some shadows in there. But because I moved my body up a little bit above it, it was not in really, really harsh light. When you, uh, said, when you spot metered, where did you spot meter, Elaine? I probably spot metered this lightest part. Right in there, okay. Now, because what I wanted to really bring out in this was the sharpness of these petals. I like that definition in those petals come front and forward. The actual center detail is a little bit soft, but that wasn't my main focus, so I wasn't concerned, and it's not so soft that it's distracting. This was an interesting one. I actually, just kind of happened upon this little flower as 
I, my intent was not to go out looking for a vision. I was sitting on the patio and this little flower happened to be hanging over the edge of the pond. It's a rhododendron and the canopy above it is very dark. And most of the flowers were in the dark with the exception of this one right here was low and there was a ray of sun just kind of glowing on it. And what struck me about the flower was the contrast between the lighting on that one and the darkness of these unopened buds right behind it, but also the contrast in the texture and the shape. So that was what I was trying to highlight. Um, I wanted the flowers around it kind of frame these two in the center here, but I did not want them to be quite as sharp as these two, which is what I wanted to highlight. So you can see that my aperture is wide open. I was about probably 10 feet away from it so that the depth of field was not all that sharp, but it was, um, it was not all that shallow, I should say. But it was shallow enough that I did was able to get some softness in those flowers there and still have some uh, sharpness in the detail of these. I was not particularly happy with the result after I took this into post-processing. For some reason, the flowers looked greeny, and I don't know why. There was not a lot of digital noise. Um, the ISO is fairly low here. Um, I, I don't understand, but they did have that kind of a sandpapery look to them. So this is one case where I did apply a painterly um, artistic filter to give it a little bit of a painterly look. Um, and it helped to soften those petals that, that looked very grainy. Took that away without taking all of the detail away. So you apply that painterly look through a filter in Photoshop or one of the plugins? This one was in Photoshop. It's the oil paint filter. Okay. Boy, that's, that was absolutely beautiful shot. I love that. This is one of my favorite flowers. It's a uh, double blood root flower. It's also kind of a rare flower, hard to find. Um, there are lots of single hellebores out there, but this one is a double. And it doesn't bloom for very long. When it blooms, it's quite interesting. This sheath around it here is like a protective sheath that, that just wraps itself around the flower. Um, even after it's bloomed. At nighttime, this will close up and the sheath will totally wrap itself around the flower again. Now, I took this shot um, mid-morning when the flower was coming out, but it was not fully open. So it has that asymmetrical look to it. But again, what intrigued me about this flower was the soft color, uh, the veining on the petals, the interesting center in that interesting sheath. And again, I wanted to isolate this one, so I darkened the background. Now, this is an example of one that I had to shoot down towards the ground, which was just a lot of dirt and sticks and stones because there were, this is early spring and there were not a lot of other flowers blooming. So the ground was pretty bare and by Again, spot metering the flower that naturally made the darker ground uh, go pretty dark. It was underexposed. But I did apply a vignette and then probably painted in um, a little more in the areas surrounding the flower uh, to make it darker. Mm -hmm. um, I noticed on that flower that you have a really nice um, mist of, of moisture on it. Do you ever carry with you a, a spray can with water or a water glycerin mix and spray it onto the flowers? I usually don't. Um, sometimes if I've got some flowers in the house that are in a vase, I'll do that. It's 
not always necessary outside because we frequently have dew on our flowers in the morning and there are plenty of shots to get like that. This doesn't happen to be dew, that is actually iridescence in the flower. Oh, okay. And that a has a very iridescent sheen to it, but it's not always noticeable unless it's in the right light. And a question came in uh, when you were talking about the darkening the background. And uh, Claire asked, what are the techniques that you would use? You mentioned you used a vignette, but then you may use uh, darken a little bit more. What do you mean by that? Would you use like a, an adjustment brush in Lightroom? An or? adjustment brush. Go around and, and set it so that it underexposes it a little more. Okay. Um, Often I can just close in the vignette all around the flower and then just make some minor adjustments, go along the petals and um, soften the opacity, reduce the opacity so it, it doesn't look unnatural. And when I do that, what I find is it, it darkens the back and it just creates a nice shadow on some of those edges. Mm -hmm. Um, but I also do use, especially when I'm indoors, I will use the black core board to put right behind it. Um, another method that I use is in Photoshop, I will select the flower and then invert that selection and just slide the exposure slider all the way to the left so that it's totally unexposed. Now, sometimes, and this is, this is not my preferable approach to it, because sometimes the edges of the flower will almost look like they've been cut out and pasted on when you do that, because mm -hmm. the selection is never perfect. And when that happens, then I will have to go in with a brush again and kind of soften that edge um, or create a feather in, my, in the settings of that selection. It's not the easiest way. It's my least preferred way to, to darken the background. This one is a bit whimsical, um, kind of an interesting story. What really caught my attention again was this flower, uh, the way the light was hitting it, the play of the shadows on it. And I was trying my best to isolate this. But this darn little scylla over here kept trying to get in the way. <laughs> and no matter what I tried to do to get it out of the way, and I didn't have a stake or anything else, um, it just kept coming back. And it was like a little photo bomber. But I decided as I'm looking at it that hey, this really provides kind of a nice contrast, contrast in color, contrast in shape. Um, so I left it there and just cropped the white flower a little bit. Um, but it still shows the contrast in size, and I was kind of happy with that. This was in very bright light, and I did have to increase the shutter speed significantly um, to reduce some of that light. Um, Elaine, I noticed you used on that one, uh, back on there for a second. I noticed that you used uh, F7.1. What would drive you to maybe use F16 or something like that? Do you, you have a conscious thought process on what your aperture well, is? I, I wouldn't go that high unless I'm in macro mode. And again, because of the type of camera that I'm using, I can get a really good depth of field at much lower um, f-stops. Okay. And I really had no need to go that high. I, even in macro, I don't go much higher than 14 and try not to. I think my sweet spot is at between F11 and F14. So I try not to go any higher than F16, but really it, it wasn't necessary. Okay, thank you. It's, um, it's 816 now. I think what I'm gonna su suggest that if anybody needs to leave, you could you could do that without offending anybody. Okay, so don't don't feel bad about that because I know we have some obligations. I think Elaine, if we could continue on uh, and do a couple more, uh, and then maybe we'll then revisit the week after next after we have our field trip. 
then we can schedule another, like a Wednesday night session, and we can do this and maybe then talk about our experiences and the trials and tribulations over at Hershey and, and some of the ways we can get around some of the problems we had. So, so if anybody needs to leave now, they could because of commitments, but we can continue on to maybe like 8.30. Would that be okay with? Okay. Okay. Uh, Joe, are you talking uh, Wednesday, August the 11th? I haven't looked at the calendar yet, but let me get that up here. Uh, let's see here. Uh, that would work. Does it see any reason why we couldn't do that? That looks good to me. Okay. Why don't we plan on that one then? Um, and that'll be really good after our trip to Hershey because then everybody's going to have a question. I, rah, 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 you know, like me, I will. <laughs> and then uh, Lane can talk us through that. Yeah, Elaine, does that date suit you? Yes, it does. Okay, excellent. Okay, so let's okay. pick up another one or two. This is All so right. exciting. And by the way, if there's one that I'm, I'm not pulling up that you'd like to know about, take note of this number at the top left-hand corner and... Uh, let me know if you if you would like me to. And if anybody wants to holler out that, just push the space bar and just say the number for Elaine. Well, I, I do have a question or a comment. Uh, I'm a little bit surprised that you say some of these were taken in harsh light because one of the things that impresses me about them is the lighting, which appears to be soft and delicate and emphasizes the flower very well. It doesn't look like harsh light. Mm -hmm. Well, that's partly because I do routinely underexpose my photos, almost intentionally. Um, because again, I, I prefer exposing to the dark side rather than the light side. I, I do not subscribe to the school of um, exposed to the right. It just doesn't work for me because I am much more liable to blow out the whites. When I expose the whites. Are the things you do in processing that help with that too? Um, there's always some edits in processing. Um, when I'm spot metering, it's, there's not a lot of that that is necessary because it does expose the flower properly when I spot meter. Now, okay. sometimes there are a few highlights that I need to bring down. I typically don't use a, a global exposure reduction. I will instead reduce highlights or shadows Sometimes I need to increase the whites. Um, they're never perfect. So there okay. are always some minor adjustments to exposure. Do you, do you typically, I know you, you mentioned about putting your body in the way to block some of the light. Do you typically use a diffuser or something to block the harsh light to soften it? Not unless I have to. It's usually my, my body works well enough to do that. Okay. <laughs> and there aren't a lot of areas in, in our gardens that have a lot of harsh light because we do live in the woods. And so there's only a few <laughs> gardens in the center, um, of, or right around the perimeter of our house that are getting quite a bit of full sun now that we've had to take down some trees. Um, I have to watch what time of day I go out. I'm not a morning person, so I'm never out there in the ideal times to get these, but I try not to photograph between noon and three o'clock that's really rough. Okay, thanks. Elaine, you have a, a request for to walk, walk us through and explain number 12 and number 15. 12 and 15. Okay. All right. This is another greenhouse shot, and it was taken several years ago. And it happened to be a flower that was growing in a very crowded pot in a very crowded bench full of pots of the same flower. So it was difficult to isolate this flower from the rest of the flowers that are just bunched up against us, uh, against it. Um, but I wanted, I wanted to show the backside of this flower because it was so interesting. I also have a series called The Rear View, and this is one of them. The flower was yellow. Um, I did not particularly like the, the color of it in this case, so I converted it to black and white and put a little bit of sepia tone on it. What I was really focused on was the detail in the center of the back of the flower here, and also the detail in these petals. It was just 
magnificent. I mean, it made such a beautiful shape. Um, and again, because I wanted to isolate this flower, I turned the, be the background totally black. And I do believe this is when I had to take into Photoshop to do that. I did not have any black foam core board with me. So I, <clears throat> I selected the flower in Photoshop, inverted it, turned the background completely black. And then I had to go over these edges, kind of fine tune that selection so it didn't look like a cut and paste flower. This image probably is one of the floral images that I've done that has taken the longest in post to get the look that I wanted. And, and Elaine, you say the longest. How much time would you typically spend, I, I know it's hard to say because they all vary, uh, on a flower in post-processing? You talking minutes, hours, days? Well, the two that I posted yesterday in Facebook were about five minutes each. Oh. This one, I would have to say in total, I spent about 10 hours on it. Okay. So it varies dramatically. It just depends upon what I was up against, the environmental challenges, the background, mm -hmm. so many things. Yeah, I probably got 10 versions of this particular flower before I came up with one that I liked. And uh, Mary Fox, thank you very much for walking her through that. And number 15. Number 15, uh, it's from Jim. This is actually one of my favorites. Um, being a nature lover, I've always been intrigued with the symbiotic relationship between flowers and bees. Um, I'm just in awe of it. And it's so important to this planet that I am frequently photographing bees and flowers and butterflies and flowers and hummingbirds and flowers. And in this case, um, the bee appears to be the center subject, but the flower is equally important just because of this relationship. It's a codependency. The bee depends upon the flower for food. The flower depends upon the bee to pollinate. So both of those had to be in very clear focus. Um, the background that you see here is not all that far away from this flower. It's an, another bunch of flowers that are just like this. So I did use a longer uh, lens on this one to compress that background and shot it at a pretty wide aperture, blur that background out because I wanted to make sure that this flower stood out with the bee itself. Had to shoot it fairly fast because bees don't sit still for any period of time. And again, low ISO. Um, high ISO wouldn't have been needed anyway because it was fairly bright. Would you have used a polarizer on that shot? You know, Joe, I don't think I had it on that day. Okay. Where was the focus point on that? Right here. It, okay, thanks. I tried taking some bee shots last weekend and I posted and they were not nearly as good as this. That's why I <laughs> asked for some help. So thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Anybody else have a suggestion? Maybe you could um, scroll through some more, uh, Elaine, just so they could see some and maybe they kick up an interest. Oh my God, look at that. Look at 31. Oh my God. <laughs> This one? Oh, I, I, that's just me. I just reacted in, into it. I mean, it's instinctively to that number 31. Oh, my gosh. It's, uh, 36 is amazing. Yeah. Oh, 36. When we do 36. 36? Yeah. This is actually a very old one. It's taken at a uh, sun field, sunflower field in Maryland. And it was getting late in the afternoon. And this butterfly just happened to land on this flower where the light was just penetrating its wings and it just glowed. So the focal point in this photo was 
the butterfly, but it was also about the symbiotic relationship between the two. But what also intrigued me about the flower was the shadow of the bug, of the butterfly right here. I wanted that to stand out. Um, also, because it's a bright yellow flower, again, I had to make sure that I'm um, not overexposing it because yellow is just as bad as red and white when it comes to, be, to being oversaturated. And I wanted to see those lines in there rather than just have blobs of yellow. So I did spot meter that there. I was not really happy um, with this detail. It didn't need to be perfectly sharp, but it was a little bit too soft for me. How'd you get the black background? This was another one that I believe that I took into Photoshop, okay. selected the flower and inverted it and turned the exposure all the way down. You know, Elaine, I can tell by the questions we're getting and knowing some of the audience is asking them. I think on that Wednesday, if you could take one image and show how you get a dark background like that, maybe not a real complicated one where you have to go into Photoshop, uh, but just step us through that process. I think everybody would be fascinated to see how you get these black backgrounds like that, because I am. So it is um, 8.30. I'm gonna suggest that um, we, we call it an evening. And then on the 11th at seven o'clock, we will have another Zoom session. And at that one, we will continue reviewing the images that you have here. And then also talk about what we did at Hershey. And um, so any other final questions before we, uh, we sign off? Well, just a, a request. Uh, one of the other things I would appreciate you doing on the 11th would be uh, a brief explanation about how you create your dis digital frames. They look beautiful and help to accentuate the flowers. Oh, okay. Great. And the uh, thank yous are coming in, Elaine, right and left. Uh, everybody really enjoyed it so far. And uh, I'm sure they will even more next on the, on the 11th. So see everybody on Saturday the 7th at 9 o'clock at uh, Hershey Gardens. And, be re and we have a rain date of that, by the way. If it is raining really hard, or if we predict it's going to be raining hard, we will let you know on Friday night probably around you know five, six, seven o'clock uh, that it has been postponed and then it'll be postponed for the following week on the 14th. We, uh, according to what the weather person says, it's gonna be okay on Saturday, but just in case, just look at your email on uh, Friday, uh, late afternoon, early evening and to see if there's been a cancellation. Uh, Joe, if I might suggest we could make that uh, maybe a little more definitive. Do you want to say like seven o'clock? If, if you don't see an email from us by seven o'clock Friday night, it's a go. Okay. Or, or maybe could we do it positive one way or the other? Just say it's definitely a go or it's not a go. Okay. Somebody thinks that maybe we forgot. Uh, can do that. Okay. Why don't we do that? Uh, so that'll be a seven o'clock on Friday the uh, sixth or Saturday. Okay. Elaine, thank you very much. I think everybody's been unmuted. We can give a hand, a round of applause for her. I really, we really appreciate okay. it. Thank you, Elaine. Terrific, Elaine. My pleasure. Thank you, Elaine. Thank you, Elaine. Thank you. Very nice. Okay, Elaine, thank you very much. That was an excellent presentation. Uh, 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 beautiful flower photographs. Uh, looking forward to the next session. And of course, the uh, field trip uh, to Hershey Garden should be wonderful too. Uh, anyone have anything for the good of the order? Night. Okay, night. guys, thank you very much. Good night. Good night. Good night. Thank good night, you. Elaine, we had 49 people. And 